Hello, everyone, and welcome to practice exercises set three. I'm going to go over today's questions like usual. And at the end of the session, if you have any questions that have to do with tomorrow's exam or any clarification you need, let me know. So exercise one, if we have two integers, x and y, they're both odd, their sum is even, we have to prove this. Three ways direct proof, contraposition and contradiction. So in the direct, direct proof, it's something like what we did in the recitation. You're, you have to prove they are, you're given that they're odd, you have to prove that their sum is even. So, hey, what does it mean to be odd? That means that X is in the form of two times something plus one, and Y is two times something plus one. We write A here, we write B here, because X is not necessarily the same as Y. They're probably different, so we use two different variables, let's say, for A and B. Okay, direct proof, so you just sum them. Da, da, da. You can take two common, so it's going to be all two times something. That something is K, such that K is A plus B plus 1. There you go, they're even. Simple enough, direct proof. What about contraposition? So contraposition, we have P implies Q. P is that both X and Y are odd, so their sum is even. Contraposition, we want to prove that not Q gives me not P. So if the sum of X and Y is odd, then X and Y are not both odd. Okay. Remember, Q was that their sum is even, so not Q is now going to be their sum is odd. Again, we're given that X plus Y is odd this time. Okay, we will now, now prove that either X or Y is not odd. So let's say X is the sum minus Y. Two cases for y. If y is even, so y is 2 times something, then the difference was going to be x equals 2n plus 1. This should be minus 2a. OK. And this is, we take 2 in common, it's going to be 2 minus a. Okay, fair enough. So it's in the form of something that's odd. Two times something, there's just a spelling mistake. It should be x is 2n plus 1 minus 2a, which is 2 into n minus a plus 1. So if y is even, then we get that x is odd. So for this case, it's fine. Not both x and y are odd. What about the other case? If y is odd, then same thing, difference, you get this time that x is even. So the contrapositive statement is valid. If you're given that x and y are both odd, uh, sorry, if you're given that the sum of x and y are odd, then that means not both of them are odd. One of them has to be even. Okay. As usual, if you're, I'm going through the solution. So if, you, if something doesn't make sense or you want me to emphasize on something, please ask. Finally, proof by contradiction. So again, what did we have? X and Y are both odd, then their sum is even. That's the original statement. So X and Y are odd integers and the sum is odd. So with contradiction, like the given, which is like P, is going to stay the same. X and Y are both odd. The difference is the conclusion. We're going to assume that the, the conclusion is opposite of what we're trying to do. So we assume that the, the, that the sum is also odd. But remember, with the original statement, we're trying to prove that it's even. So we're, we're required to prove that the sum 
is even. But the way contradiction works, it says, hey, let's assume that the sum is odd and we reach something that's not right, something explodes. So x plus y is 2m plus 1. OK? We are assuming that the sum is odd. By the, okay, by the definition of some integer n. Then we'll take y to the other side. So x is the sum minus y. We are given that y is odd. Remember, x and y, they're both odd. So y is 2a plus 1 for some a. The difference between two odd numbers is even, right? Just one goes with the one, and you're left with 2n minus 2m. So just take something in common. We might have here some spelling mistakes. This should be a minus, but that's OK. Which makes x even. Contradiction. I'll repeat. We assume that the sum x plus y is odd. Then we said, hey, x is going to be something that's odd minus y. But y is also odd because of the given. So it's like some odd number minus another odd number. Simple proof, this is going to give you that something that's even. But both x and y are odd. Where are you? Hey, x and y are both odd. So that's where you get your contradiction. Your assumption that the sum is odd is wrong. There you go, the sum is even. So that's the third way of proving this. That's problem one. Problem two. Prove each of the following statements and specify the proof you used. Number one is easy enough. Show that if P is odd and Q is also odd, then this multiplication is going to be a multiple of four. I won't dive into this because it's just expansion. So you have P is some 2, 2, 2, 2K plus 1. It's something that's odd. And you have Q is, let's say, 2R plus 1. Another thing that's odd, just multiply them, and you have to reach at the end four times something. That's how you know that it's a multiple of four. It's four times something. Okay. If you have a problem with part one, let me know. So this is direct proof. Exercise two, part two. Show that if u is an odd integer, then the equation x squared plus x minus u equals zero has no solution. Again, usually what we do is has no solution that is an integer. That's important. Usually what we do is first thinking is direct proof. So if you want to do this with a direct proof, you try to do something like calculating this thing. I forgot its name for a minus bc, something like that, or it's a squared minus. F. You get it. But that you probably won't reach anywhere using this. So a different approach is. Is it contradiction? It is. We prove by contradiction. So again, we're, we want to prove that this doesn't have a solution. So your assumption should be, hey, assume that it does have a solution. And this solution is n. So there exists some integer in z. You replace, you, you plug it in the equation, and it does have a solution. So n squared plus n minus u, it does equal 0. In other words, u is this. OK, so you take these guys to the other side, or you take u to the other side, take n in common. So u is n into n plus 1. Two cases for n. If n is odd, n plus 1 is even, which makes u even, right? n is odd, so n plus 1 is even. And even times odd is going to give you even, because obviously like you have it here, 2 times something. OK, the other case, if n is even, then n plus 1 is odd, which also makes you even. So 
You see the contradiction? Remember, show that if u is odd, then the equation has no solution. So what do we do? First, we assume that the equation does have a solution, which is this. And we deduce that u is going to be even in all of the cases. That's your contradiction. U is, you assumed u to be odd, but not here you have it even. So explosion, contradiction, doesn't work. Part three, show that for any x that is an integer, if x squared minus one is not divisible by three, then x is divisible by three. Hint, what does it mean to be divisible by three or multiple of three? Then it means this. Any number, any integer is either gonna be a multiple of three, so it equals three k, or it's gonna be, or there's gonna be a remainder of one after you divide by three, or a remainder of two. There can't be a remainder of three because, hey, three k plus three, just take three in common, and you're back to the first case. So what do you wanna prove? If x squared minus one is not divisible by three, then x is divisible by three. After you crack your head in it, one of the solutions is to use contraposition. Why? Well, when we say contraposition, what are we gonna get? We're gonna get this. We need to prove that for any x, if x is not divisible by three, then x squared minus one is divisible by three. Regardless of the then, this first part is easier. You're given that x is not divisible by three. So using the hint, x is either this or this. Since it's not divisible by three, so you have a remainder of one or a remainder of two. So you just go with the cases. Case one, it's divisible, uh, it's, the remainder is one. So you calculate what x squared minus one is, ta, 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 you get three times something. So x squared minus one is divisible by three. Same thing for the second case, remainder of two, calculate three times m. I won't go through the details of this. If you have a problem, I'll explain it, but you can like, check the solution on your own. It's just expansion, then you wanna take the multiple in common. If you're trying to prove multiple of three, you wanna take three in common. If you're trying to prove even, you wanna take two in common and so on. So since the contrapositive is true, so the original statement is true because they have the same truth value. Part four, if a squared plus b squared is c squared, then a plus b plus e is greater than or equal to c. a, b, and c are all non-negative integers. Hmm. How can we do this? Well, step one is working backwards, or method one is working backwards. This is going to be a surprise tool that we'll use in a bit. So a squared plus b squared equals c squared. This is your given. It's the same as saying that c is square root of a squared and b squared. Can we understand backward reasoning? Yeah, that's, that's what we're doing right now. So this part, it is backward reasoning. Let's just see the solution and I'll explain it in a bit. It's gonna be pretty obvious in a second. So this is just your given. Remember, with any implication, when you say P implies Q, it's kind of your given, you want to reach the conclusion Q. So this is P, your given, this is what you want to reach Q. Now, backward reasoning is all about, hey, let's start with what I'm actually trying to prove. So you want to prove that A plus B is greater than or equal to C. So. Uh, I'll go back to number three in a second. So a plus b is greater than or equal to c. It's equivalent to a squaring both sides, 
expanding a plus b. Now you substitute your given. So it's just a squared plus b squared. Remove it from both sides. You're left with 2ab is greater than or equal to 0. And that's something you can start with, right? You're given that a, b, and c are all non-negative integers. So 2 times a times b is greater than or equal to 0. And all of the steps we wrote are equivalents. So that means you can either go down like this, or you can go backwards. So going back up like this. This is, this is the idea of backward reasoning. You start with what you want to prove. You write equivalence, 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 till you reach something that's actually true, that you can start with. So you can start with 2ab is greater than or equal to 0 and go all the way back. The method used is backward reasoning. Another, You could do it in another way where, hey, this is your given. You simply add 2ab. A plus B squared, remove the square, you get this. So this is forward reasoning, if you'd like. Okay, so Sammy, you're asking for number three, backward reasoning. We didn't use for part three, backward reasoning. We just used cases, okay? So we used contraposition at, with cases. So if X is uh, not divisible by three, then this thing is going to be divisible by 3. Well, since x is not divisible by 3, then x is either going to be this, or it's going to be this. And we just expand. Like, this is an equal sign. We're just expanding to get that this thing is a multiple of 3. Okay, there's no backward reasoning here. You're asking if it works? Um. You could, if yeah, if if if, you, or if you're asking that, hey, you solved it in backward reasoning, then sure, if it, if it makes sense, why not? You could solve a, some of these problems are solvable in more than one way. You're welcome. Part five. There exists three distinct integers, if each of which is a perfect square. And the sum of the smaller two is equal to the largest one. So you have three distinct integers. They're all perfect squares. So like a squared, b squared, c squared. The sum of the smaller two, let's, let's say a and b, is equal to the largest one. And they're saying there exists. So it makes sense. Yeah, this is similar to like the Pythagoras theorem, you just have to find a, b, and c that makes this works, but a, b, and c have to all be integers. So if we choose a to be 3, b to be 4, and c to be 5, you get something that works. 9 plus 16 is 25. So that's it for part 5. You just find an example that works. Any problem with exercise one or two before we continue? Okay. Exercise three. Again, it's something that we, we, we went through something like this in the recitation. So you want to prove that these four statements are equivalent. I told you one way of doing it is this. One implies to prove, prove that one implies two. Prove that 2 implies 3, 3 implies 4, and then prove again that 4 implies 1. So kind of doing this circle of implications, that way they're equivalent. You, or, or you could do, hey, 1 is equivalent to 2, 2 is equivalent to 3, 3 is equivalent to 4. Or you, you could do something like that, and then they're all equivalent, whatever makes you happy. Hmm. Let's do a couple of these. I, I don't think they're going to be very difficult. Let's say one implies two. So you're given that three n plus one is even. 
you want to prove that n plus 1 squared is also even. So if 3n plus 1 is even, then it's 2 times something. OK, then 3n equals 2k minus 1. This means that 3n is odd, right? It's 2k minus 1. It's similar to like 2k plus 1. It's the form of odd. So 3n is odd. They're, they're saying as a note, hey, we can show by contraposition or contradiction that n is, then that n must therefore also be odd. They're just saying, hey, since 3n is odd, then that means that n is odd. For now, you just take this as given because later, and I think in an exercise way down, we're, we'll prove this that if 3n is odd, then n is odd. So, since n is odd, remember what we're trying to prove is that n plus 1 squared is even. So, simply now you can plug in n, right? n plus 1 squared, 2t plus 1 plus 1 squared, da -da -da, da -da -da, you get eventually 2 times something. Okay, that's the whole idea 2 times something. So, this is done. 1 implies 2. What about 2 implies 3? You're given that n plus 1 squared is even. Then n squared minus 1 is divisible by 4. Hmm. OK. Since n is an integer, it is either odd or even. This is a tool you can usually use. Because if you noticed in part one, we also, hey, we just assumed that we proved that n is odd. Usually in these implications, n is either going to be odd or even in most of the cases. So just eliminate one of the possibilities and say, hey, n has to be even. And then the easiest thing in the world you can do is plug in n being even or odd. So since n is an integer, it's either odd or even. Assume n is even. Then if you expand n plus 1, da, 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 you get that it's odd. But remember, we're proving now this implication. So n plus 1 squared is even. It's given that it's even. It's not odd. So this is kind of like a mini contradiction. So n has to be odd. Again, you assumed n is even. You got that n plus 1 squared is odd. But this is wrong since it's given that it's even. Therefore, hey, n has to be odd. And like I said before, just now plug it in what you're actually trying to prove. We're actually trying to prove that n squared minus 1 is divisible by 4. So we substitute n being odd here. Expand. Take 4 in common. 4 times something, hey, it's divisible by 4. Well, we only have two left of this. Let's actually, let's just finish this problem. 3 implies 4. So n squared minus 1 is divisible by 4. Does that mean that n squared is odd? Let's see what they say. OK, actually, a different way of proving. So. What does it mean that n squared minus 1 is divisible by 4? It means this. OK, so we're saying that this statement is equivalent to this, that n squared minus 1 is equal to 4k for some k. n squared minus 1 is 2 into 2k. Take 1 to the other side. So you prove that n squared is odd. OK? n squared is odd, and that's it for this implication. So you could say this is like direct proof, direct implication here. Last one, n squared is odd. Can we get that 3n plus 1 is even? I think here, yeah, we're going to use the whole eliminating idea. Because look. It's like th this may be one of the easier cases to see. 
n squared is odd, right? So there's no way that n is going to be even. Because if n is even, then it's going to be 2k times 2k, which is definitely even, right? So n squared is no longer odd. So hey, prove that n can't be even, n has to be odd, and just plug it in what you're trying to prove, and it's done. We know that n is an integer, either odd, either even. If it is even, we get explosion. We get that n squared is even, which is wrong. Therefore, n squared is odd means that n is odd. Just plug it in what we were trying to prove. You get it's even. We get that 3n plus 1 is even. We can see. All of this stuff. Therefore, the four statements are equivalent to each other. Any problem with exercise three? The only like tricky part is, hey, what does it mean to prove that these four statements is equivalent? Because doing what this thing here might be a hassle or might be time consuming. One equivalent to two, two equivalent to three, three equivalent to four. Maybe it's easier maybe to just prove one implies two, two implies three, three, four, four, one. Yes, these are four implications, but these are six implications because each equivalence is going to the left and then going to the right, left, right, left, right. Exercise four. Hmm. Prove each of the following. So this is mostly going to be mathy. Prove the triangle inequality. For any real number x and y, the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y is greater than or equal to x plus y. Intuitively, it makes sense, right? Because if uh, let's look at it as cases. If x and y are both positive, it's equal. It's the same. They're both positive. If it's if they're both neg negative, it's also the same equal. Because hey, minus two plus minus three. And here we have minus two minus three. It's gonna be five equals five. The only case where it differs is when one of them is going to be negative and the other is positive. And obviously, if you break it down into the absolute value of x and y, it's going to be bigger than if you let one of them compromise the other, let's say. So yeah, obviously, it's true. Let's, let's prove it. So case one and case two is what I said when they're both negative or both positive. It's easy enough. So x plus y is x plus y is x plus y. x plus y is minus x minus y because they're both negative. Take the negative in common. It, it's the absolute value of x plus y. OK, now we go to part three. Here, we're going to assume that x is not negative and y is negative. Again, in your course, there is something that we say without loss of generality. So it's true that there's a case for where x is negative and y is positive. But it's the same case as 3. You only flip the variable x and y. But like it's fine if you flip them, it's just a name. That's why we that's why we say, hey, there's only case three, but without loss of generality. And we say x is non-negative instead of saying that x is positive. I guess this just means that hey, x could be zero. Okay. So diving into case three. Even in case three, we have two subcases. Because x is negative is x is non-negative, y is negative. 
But is x bigger or smaller than the absolute value of y? Let's say x is bigger than minus y. That means if you sum them together, it's still going to be something that's positive. So the absolute value of x plus y is going to be x plus y, right? It's x plus y is positive, so you can remove the absolute value. But it's less than x. Why? You have x, you add something negative to it, it's definitely going to be less than x. However, x plus y is going to be x plus the absolute value of y, which is bigger than x. Why? You have x, you added something positive to it. So you have this formula, and you have this formula. You can conclude what you're trying to prove, which is the absolute value of x plus y. This thing is less than x, which is less than absolute value of x plus absolute value of y. This is what I meant by mathy. Just a lot of absolute, 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 absolute. Okay, so that's the first subcase. Similarly, you can get how we do the other subcase. You can read it and let me know if you have any problems. Part two, for any real number that's not zero, x power minus one, absolute value, is one over x. Easy enough. Either x is gonna be, up, gonna be positive or it's gonna be negative. It's not gonna be zero because it's given that it's not zero. Let's say it's positive, x power minus one, is going to be 1 over x. It's positive, so it's 1 over x, so it's 1 over absolute value of x. OK, done. The, the thing is, the absolute value was for the entire fraction. Now it's just over x. So step one, what does x power minus 1 mean? It just means 1 over x. Well, x is positive, so absolute value of 1 over x is 1 over x. Again, x is positive, so you can simply you can add the absolute value to it without it harming. If it's negative, same thing. Absolute value of 1 over x is minus 1 over x, because x is negative. You can put the minus sign downstairs. Minus x is positive, because x is negative. So you get this. Hmm, part three and part four. Let's see if they're also very long. Not so much. So let's prove this time that the subtraction, that the difference of x minus y is bigger than this for all real numbers. Consider adding minus y and y. If you did it in another way, it's OK. Let's see a creative way of doing it. So you add the minus y and y to x. So it's kind of like adding 0. You did nothing. However, what did we prove in part 1? This thing. Assume that x minus y is just some element a. So a plus y is less than a plus y. Now what? You can just plug it in. What's x minus y? It's this, which is less than this. y goes with y, so you proved it. Take a second, look at it. And part four. All 
Okay. Does anybody have a problem with this? X minus Y plus Y is less than this. Mm -hmm. But we have this thing, and there you go. Okay. Part four. Let's read it together. Why not? The absolute value of the absolute value of X minus the absolute value of Y. Is it less than this thing? Two cases. If it's bigger than zero, part three. You just remove the absolute value and we just proved this in part three. Other case, if it's negative, then it equals minus the difference. Or, yeah, so insert the minus. It's y minus x. It's less than this. Again, part three. And you, you can add the minus sign just so you can get the look that you're going for. I probably advise solving three and four again. If three and uh, solving exercise, what, which four in general again, if you had problems while solving. Exercise five. Prove or disprove with justification each of the following. Indicate the method of proof. We're almost there, guys. Just exercise five and six left. Part one. Two x squared minus four x plus three. It's positive for any real x. Yeah. How can we know that? These might be enough. Yeah. Ah, okay, we also have to take this. So yeah, you take two in common, you're left with x squared minus two x plus one. How? Just split the three into plus two and plus one. But x squared minus two x plus one identity, you can get x minus one squared. This is always positive because x is an integer. Or in this case, x is a real number. So you get two times something that po that's positive plus one. This is always going to be positive. So let's say direct proof. X plus two is prime for every prime number X. No, let's say X is seven. Seven is prime, seven plus two is nine. This is odd, but not prime, right? It's divisible by three. Mm, they use 2. So 2 plus 2 is 4. It also works. The sum of two irrational numbers is always irrational. No, just minus a plus a is 0. Let a be irrational. So radical 2 plus minus radical 2. There exists three consecutive odd integers that are prime. Three consecutive odd integers that are prime. Yes, apparently there is just three, five, and seven. They're odd, they're consecutive, they're prime. So, yeah. So, disprove by counter, by counter, constructive existential proof. The product of two irrational numbers is always irrational. Of two irrational numbers is always irrational. No. Radical 2 times radical 2 is 2. n power 4 minus n squared is even for all integers. And well, it's easy to check. Right, and is either going to be even or it's going to be odd. Just see both cases. Direct proof: they took n squared in common, and then n minus one into n plus one. They got this. Now the cases: if n is even, 
then n squared is going to be even, right? Even times even. Uk, uk times whatever, it's even. It's two times something. If n was odd, so n is 2k plus 1. Well, you have here 2k plus 1, and you add a 1 to it, so it's going to be something that's even. So yes, the multiplication is also even. Finally, you prove this. It is even for all integers n. For all integers n, because notice, any number is either going to be divisible by 2 or not. So any number is going to be either odd or it's going to be even. You could say, hey, I want to prove it for all multiples of 3. So any number is either going to be multiple of 3 or divisible or remainder 1 or remainder 2. Like any integer is either odd or even. Any integer is either divisible by 3, or there's a remainder 1, or there's a remainder 2. But obviously, we want to go with the shorter route. The product of a rational and an irrational number is irrational. This reminds me of someone who used the forum that relates to this part. No, not necessarily. Zero is rational times anything that's irrational. You get zero, which is rational. Zero multiplied by any irrational number is zero, which is rational. Finally, we get to exercise six. If you have any, if you have any problems with the previous exercises, let me know now. Okay, so exercise six, part one, show that the cubic root of two is irrational. This is actually a very nice question. So focus with me here a bit. We're going to be using contradiction. So we want to show that it's irrational. Let's assume that it is rational and we reach a contradiction. So assume that the cubic root of 2 is rational. What does it mean to be rational? It means this. For You have two integers, m and n, with no common factors. n is obviously not going to be 0, such that this. So again, the cubic root of 2. We're assuming that it's rational, so you can write it in the form of n m over n. Obviously, n can't be 0, and m and n don't have any common factors. So 9 over, three, 9 over let's say, 6 doesn't work. It has to be two over, uh, 3 over 2, for example. OK, so there's no common factors. Obviously, I'm stressing so much on that there's no common factors because our contradiction is going to be that, ah, actually, they do have common factors between them. So how can we do that? Step one, take the cube of both sides. Should, that, should just raise it to the power of three on both sides. You get two equals m cubed over n cubed. Press cross, two n cubed. Uh, equals m cubed. What
Okay, so apparently I got disconnected. Can you guys hear me? Okay, good. Uh, what's the last thing you heard me say? Was it Lama 2? Did I start with Lama 2? You can't hear me, Samer? Yeah, please. Okay. Okay, while well, Sam rejoins, uh, what's the last thing you heard me say? Was it Lemma 1 or Lemma 2? I'll repeat from Lemma 1 either way. Let's just wait a minute. Okay, great. So, Lemma 1 was saying if you have odd times odd, it's going to give you another odd because this is something we proved in the recitation. You can simply multiply them and you'll get the format of an odd. Now, we want to use this to prove that if m cubed is even, then you get that m is also even. How? We'll use contraposition. So, if this was p implies q, so you have m cubed even, it gives you that m is even. What's contraposition? Hey, you have m is odd. Does that mean that m cubed is also odd? And it does, because if you have m power 3, it's just m times m times m, which is odd times odd times odd. Using lemma 1, the first two odds, they're going to give you an odd. Then this with this is going to give you another odd. So, lemma, so using lemma one, we proved this. We proved not Q implies not P, which means P implies Q is also correct. In short words, we just proved that M is even. So that means M is 2K for some integer K. What's m power 3? It's 2k power 3. It's 8 times k power 3. OK, good. But remember, we have m power 3 is 2n power 3. This was the original statement we had. Substitute m, m power 3, we get this. We remove 2 with 8. We're left with n power 3 is 4k power 3. So that means that m power 3 is even. But again, using the same logic we did for m power 3, that means that n is also even. So m is even, n is even. So, you, so there is a common factor, which is 2. You can cross 2 by 2 at least, maybe even more. So they do have common factors. There go. Contradiction. Okay. I'll run through the idea quickly. We assume that the square that the cube root of two is rational, so that means you can write m over n such that m and n don't have any common factors. N n is different than zero. We we raised both sides to power three crisscrossed, we got this thing. This tells us, tells us that m power 3 is even. We proved that if m power 3 is even, then that means m is also even. We proved it using lemma 1 and lemma 2. Similarly, since m is even, you get that m power 3 is this. You plug it in this. m power 3 is even. So n is also even. 
Both of them being even means they have at least two as a common factor. So contradiction, it's not actually rational. So any problem with part one? OK. I'll do part two quickly, and then we'll open the floor if you have any questions. Part two is way easier. For all real numbers r, there, exact, there is exactly one number q where q times r is r. Let's first assume that r is not zero. Okay, so for the following, assume that r is not zero. For all real numbers r, there, exact, there is exactly one q that makes this. Well, two ways to do this, uh, actually two steps to prove this. Step one is the existence proof. Like, hey, show me that, show me an example of Q. And then the uniqueness that there is no other Q. Well, if Q is one, like if you cross R and R, you get one times R, which is R. So you get that the formula is true. For any real number, if you multiply it by one, it's gonna stay itself. So we have at least one element, one Q, that makes this true. Now we want to prove that there is no other. Assume B1 and B2 are real numbers with the above property. So you have this. We want to reach that B1 equals B2. This is where the uniqueness comes. We're saying, hey, assume you have two real numbers that makes this formula true. Like you have two Qs, like Q1, Q2, or B1, B2. So you have this and this true. We want to reach that they're the same. So B1 times R is R. Well, substitute in R the other formula. So B1 equals b2 times r equals b2 times r. r goes with r, you're left with this. So we wrote the first formula, a formula and we substituted the second and the first. Similarly, we'll do the same for below. Write the second formula, substitute the first in it. r goes with r. b2 times b1 is b1. So this. And this, obviously, we're going to get B1 is B2. Because, you can, because multiplication is commutative, so you can flip B1 and B2. So it is, so it is unique. You can only find one Q, which is one, that makes this formula true. But uh, someone in the forum said, hey, what if R was zero? If R was zero, then there's a lot of Qs that could work for it. Like any number, if you multiply it by zero, it's going to stay zero, which is correct. So two ways I see this. Either the question needs to say that R is not does not equal zero, or we can say for all real numbers, like if you focus on what the question is actually saying, for all real numbers, there's only one Q. Like for R, there might be different Qs, but if you wanna sum, if you wanna include all the real numbers, they only have Q in common, which is one. So let's say everything other than zero only has Q is one, zero, has everything. So anything you multiply it by zero, it's going to stay zero. But if you intersect both of these together, you're only going to get Q is one. And I just used a bunch of symbols that I hope you actually you did take sets. So hopefully some of these are familiar. But don't worry so much about this part. If it's easier for you to swallow the pill, just assume that R is not zero. Okay, so 
that's all I have to say for practice set three. If you have any question, what time is it? Oh, 5.59, so almost exactly one hour. If you have any questions that have to do with this assignment or previous assignments or recitations or any questions you have for the exam, please ask now. What can you solve aside from reviewing assignments? Well, I assume you guys solved the quiz, whatever, the quiz uh, multiple choice that was on Moodle. So there's that, there's the recitations. I, in my last, in the last recitation, I included some extra reviewing exercises that I didn't solve in the main session. So you can go and check these, uh, those again. But uh, the ideas that, that are required from you are pretty obvious now, like inference rules, proofs. You know that there's all these types of proofs. They're not a lot. You have direct contraposition and so on like like the the ideas are numbered so any idea that you feel you're not very strong in just google any exercises and solve them hey so like the the, the course name is discrete structures so just search discrete structures exercises on contradiction if you feel like you're weak in contradiction but you do that after you've solved everything like after you've reviewed the slides the recitation the practice exercises if you exhausted everything you have from us, that's when you use Google to go the extra step and work on some ideas that you feel you could be stronger in. You're welcome. Any other question? Okay. So if there's no other questions, I'm going to end the meeting now. I'll upload this as soon as WebEx has it ready. So you can, if you need to review it. And yeah, I'll still be available. If you have questions, you can use the forum or send me an email tonight. If you have any last questions, that's fine. You're welcome. OK. okay. Goodbye, everyone. And good luck in your exams. Study well.